Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. Hello and welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits, not so much a man who broke the mould as one who's covered in it. Well, we're still in the thick of our Edinburgh Festival Fringe coverage here on Musical Talk. And even if you weren't able to get to this year's events, I do hope that you'll get a sense of the excitement, the buzz and the atmosphere from the conversations that we're having here on Musical Talk with some of the people behind and in front of some of the great musical theatre shows which I saw. And in that spirit, we're going to be talking today to a couple of people about three shows that they were involved in, which are Dolly Parton's Nine to Five, a new piece of writing called Confessions of a Justified Songwriter, which is a devised piece by the Royal Scottish Conservatoire, with music by the very talented Keelty Brothers, and a new show by an old friend of this programme, Lawrence Owen. And it's with Lawrence we're going to start today. Now, listeners may remember from last year, I had the great pleasure of having a wonderful conversation with Lawrence about his show called Cine Musicals which was a one-man show with an amazing score, even more amazingly performed by Lawrence himself, who is a professional film and television composer, but also writes comic songs and rather splendid pastiche songs as a very successful and very effective sideline. If you can catch his one-man show anywhere in the country, I strongly recommend you do. Well, such was the success of Cine Musicals last year that he's back this year with Cine Musicals High. The concept is rather similar, The idea is that he plays a number of characters who are caught within the tropes of the particular genre of film, in this case high school films, and then plays each of the characters and has composed and sings each of their songs. That of course is merely a technical description. The show itself is an amazing tour de force and Lawrence is a highly intelligent, highly sophisticated and an amazingly talented man. He's also extremely pleasant to talk to. He's got a great sense of humour. And I've come to adore our now annual conversations. Long may that continue. But let's hear this year's entry in Lawrence Owen's impressive catalogue, which is a conversation about his new piece, Cine Musicals High. And to get you in the mood, we'll start with the opening number before we go into that conversation with the rather splendid Lawrence Owen. Play a guitar solo.
so it's your first day. The rule is that if you're gonna fit in, you're gonna have to get clued up on who's who. Come on, let me show you around. So, we have jocks, nerds, prom queens, bad girls, and weirdos. So, over here, hanging by the football field, you got your jocks. Hey guys! Fuck you! Whoa, what a bunch of assholes. But you don't want to piss them off, or your head might find itself on the log flume to toilet flush canyon. And the king of the jocks in this place, that's gotta be Hogan. Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Oh, you thought we were gonna shake hands, but then I moved my hand away before we could shake hands. <laughs> you snooze your nose, douchebag. Yeah, what a great guy. Next up, it's the prom queens. Hey, girls. Fuck you. Aw, they're so cool. They rule the school from their ivory towers, breaking hearts and spending all daddy's paychecks. And the queen of them all in this place, that's gotta be Princess Kira. So, like, I Instagrammed my contouring tutorial, and, like, Cornelia, who's supposed to be, like, my BFF, said that it made me look like I was trying to hide in long grass or something. And then I was like, what does that even mean? And she was like, you totally look like a zebra and not a hot one either. And I was like, oh my god, what a bitch! Heading over to the science lab, we got your nerds. Hey, nerds! Hey, diddly ho! Whether they're playing chess in the library or captaining the mathletes team, these guys will not be going to the prom. And the undisputed big chief Buffenmeister is Jeff. Uh, 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 hello, uh, uh Jeff here. Uh, uh, wonderful to meet you all. Uh, excuse my distraction, I I'm working on a science project and, uh, uh it's a really very exciting thing. Uh, uh, hello, excuse me, is anyone listening? Hello? Hello? Dinosaurs? Dinosaurs? Oh, he's adorable. He's such a nerd. Whoa, did it just get cold in here? Oh no, we just got a little closer to the weirdos. And the weirdest girl in school, Sadako. Okay, so she doesn't really say anything, but she lives in a well. And I heard she comes to school by crawling out of a TV. But you know, we all got our issues, whatever, that's cool. And last but not least, Smoking behind the bike sheds, it's the bad girls. Tying cherry stems into knots with their tongues and leaving a trail of broken men behind them. And God, I wish I was one of them. And who is the high priestess of the illicit? Well, that would be May. Hey, you handsome. How you doing? Me? No, I'm not a bad girl. I just have prominent secondary sexual characteristics. What can I say? Some kids develop sex. I developed well-rounded people skills. Lovely to see you again. A second year on the trot with a fantastic show. For, so for you, no trouble at all about difficult second albums. <laughs> well, and also, it's certainly not a case of um, straight to video second sequel, <laughs> is it? So, uh, well, this is all this is all music to my ears. This is a big relief. It was certainly a lot harder to write this one. Um, my wife Lindsay helped me a lot with this one. The first one all came together sort of reasonably quickly and and, and fairly easily last year which lulled me into a bit of a false sense of security. <laughs> so it came to sort of September, and my wife and I had the idea, oh, why don't we try one that's like 
all set in a in one place and we stumbled across the high school movie genre and thought well that's got every archetype you could possibly want has it not yes. it, yeah they're all there already so we thought okay that would be a fun thing to do because there's scope for lots of different kinds of music even though you're in one setting because you've got all these big characters so we thought, brilliant, nailed it, and then <laughs> did nothing for about four months. A well-trodden path. In yeah, yes, terms, yes, really, yes. And then th- this show has been written and rewritten far more than the last one. So it's been a, it's been a much more of a, a sort of battling process to get through to this one, and, and, and Lindsay's been totally invaluable with that. So we wrote the story together through many drafts, and then I made the music and lyrics once we've sort of figured it all out. Well, it is the old thing about perspiration and inspiration then, isn't it? I think so, yeah. If you don't mind me saying, what comes across on stage feels like it's been matured for years. There's, there's, I can't see any perforations, I can see no um, fraying at the edges. And, and I hope you won't mind me saying this, I think there might be something in it, because last year was a quest. Yes. There was a touch of the wizard of somebody. Yes. Uh, like in some levels, you could also argue <laughs> that the wizard is not entirely far away from this one. No. That's, that's just the nature of the, uh, of the beast sometimes. No. But it feels very cohesive. I mean, it may be that you've had to put extra work in, but in some senses that's come out, you know, the, the, your... I was going to say the quality of the sausage right. coming out of the machine. <laughs> I, I worry where this is going, but you understand what I'm trying to I say. I do understand. It's a particularly it's good a, sausage. It's a gorgeous metaphor. It is, it's okay. Let's keep it. Yes. <laughs> well, I just wish I hadn't misfired halfway through. Um, you know, but it's a really good show. And Thank you. But I've got several questions I hope you won't mind me asking. Not at all. Because you actually surprised me right at the beginning because the references you gave me were references of college shows, films, things like that from the 80s onwards. You make a specific reference to Ferris. Ula yes, and his day off. Mm-hmm. And funnily enough, when I'd come in, and from the title, I'd naturally been slightly more expecting High School Musical and its many, many, many sequels. Do you know that's an interesting thing because that sort of didn't even really occur to me, and to my shame, I've never seen it. Have you? Not I've never seen any of those films. Well, if you want to know how the law of diminishing returns works, right? I think okay. Disney have very kindly offered you Disney uh, a, a, an empirical experiment. They don't. Try. They don't always get it right, do they? Well, actually, in fairness, the first one, although it's a cynical exercise in some senses, it has a real joy to it. Right. Number two and number three are. All right, well, I'll, I'll, watch, the, I'll watch the first one. Yeah. But yeah, no, t- a, a, a few people have mentioned that to me. And in fact, somebody even said to me, sort of with some surprise, oh, you mean it's not anything to do with Disney? Mm. Because oh, I, think, mean, I think... I thought... Yeah, because I think they, they, but maybe they'd seen the last one or they'd seen me do some of my sort of Disney material and naturally assumed that that's, this would be what this one is. But it, it, yeah, I've never even seen it. Have you so noticed that in the demographic of your audience? Because actually, I mean, you, you, obviously you've been getting everyone in from young and old, mm. but there's a difference between the people who remember the 80s, 90s well. spurt of films, and then those people, forgive me, the, the younger generation who would have seen the high school musicals and got into yeah. musical theatre that way, the yeah. musical films, who would be now about 25. I'd say so, yeah. Yeah, so which, have you been seeing a tendency in one direction or another? I have been seeing a different demographic to last year. Last year I actually got quite a lot of older audiences, sort of middle-aged and sort of retirement age audiences. Yeah. I well, think, I feel in one of those categories, well, <laughs> if I may say. Well, because I think the, the thing with that is because it was a sort of, um, you know, golden age of cinema yes. theme to the last one with all these kind of lights, camera, action sort of thing. Whereas this one, it's very much like if you don't like high school musicals, you might pass over it. So I did wonder whether it was going to limit my audience and uh, it was a little quiet in the first week and I did wonder whether I shot myself in the foot slightly but thankfully it's really filled up. Well you were sold out to well, uh, it w- full up today, I was, I was definitely full up today and, and uh, in the last sort of um, week or so it has been like that pretty much every day. But the demographic is different this year, it's much much more varied so I'm getting like you say young through to old. I think that's good, really. Isn't I it? think because so. That, because when the, uh, the the third one comes, or mm. whatever's next for Lawrence Owen, yes. um, hopefully you'll bring them all back in. I hope so. But there are some interesting tropes, it seems to me, and, and you can tell me I'm talking uh, barking up the wrong tree here. But in the '80s films, the jocks were the villains. Yeah. It's a sign of where society has gone, and I don't know if it's better or worse. Right. But the jock or the Zac Efron character is now is the... now the speech marks. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm ladling this with ironic speech marks if I can the hero yeah and you made such a good point I mean what I love is the theme of this amongst other things because mm-hmm. once again it's hilarious all the way through it's a masterpiece of ingenuity and songwriting oh, but, very kind thank you well no but it, no, it, it, it is mm-hmm. it's, it's so simple for me to say because you've actually presented me with the goods to judge right. um, but I judge happily because they were excellent 
So essentially, we've had this change, and therefore people have got different expectations. I would expect the younger people expecting the Zac Efron style character to be the hero. In well, you, whereas I, my generation would see it the way you have. Seen yeah. It well, 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 I you're think much it's, younger than I. <laughs> I think it's interesting. My sister uh, um, helped me with the movement direction of it. She's a she's a movement director and choreographer. Um, she's on the credits, isn't she? She is. Yeah. She is. And she uh, said, I think it's very interesting that you, m- sort of like middle class arty kid zoned in on the sporty ones as being the arseholes <laughs> and I think well yeah, yeah that says uh, that says more about me than I possibly intended but yeah I think because it was sort of based on the breakfast club type mould um, that's why I ended up going like that I think and one of the things I particularly love if I may say and you say it relatively overtly at the beginning in one of the songs actually one of the very clever lyrics which is about it's a sin to deviate from conventional, uh, conventionality oh yes say, convention Yes. And being speech marks normal once again. The worst thing to be so, different. That's yeah, the, so yeah. you have this thematic thing. So you have this very clever show. But you also have this message underneath, which mm. is that um, you should be yourself. Um, but you have to fight to be yourself sometimes because obviously convention will stop you doing so. It's a slightly, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, I feel like this one is a, is a similar but slightly different message to the previous one, which was very much about, like, you know, making your own kind of music, as it were. Um, <laughs> And this one is sort of, yeah, it has that, but there's also an element of um, working together and rec- accepting difference. And, you know, it, it feels very timely now that we've, you know, left the EU, <laughs> which I'll say nothing about. But, um, you know, it feels like a good time to be encouraging, trying to encourage people to respect difference and come be together. together. Yes. yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. But I'd like to talk, to talk about the score, if I may, because as always, you, you were such a professional in this previously with your film music writing, which is your professional career, as it were, when you're not doing this, and vice versa. Mm. Um, but there's a lovely range of songs. I, I wonder, in your previous show, Cine Musicals, in a way you can select from the genre that you pick some very distinctive styles. Yeah. If you're doing the opposite, which is what this show is in some sense, which is merging similar kinds of films into the almost archetypal perfect comedy version of one of those, yes. then actually it could be other, but perhaps you're narrowing your opportunities to plunder genre. Well, that, but actually you've made it very broad. Well, that, that, um, that did happen to some extent. Like uh, I, I had a little bit of writer's block at the beginning because I was um, thinking, well, I've, yeah, I, I, like high, for, I think I thought... High School Musical exists, yes. so, I, so although I haven't seen it, I do have to be careful not to kind of stray into that territory. And I did want to make it, um, you know, as diverse uh, musically as the last show. And it, it started off in an earlier incarnation being a lot more meta and a lot more sort of bizarre and uh, unreal. <laughs> like it originally did, it ended, it, the original ending was going to be like a sort of anime style battle sequence was it really yeah it's hard now having seen it to see how you might <laughs> shoehorn that in really. I don't really yes. know I think that was possibly a draft that is, far, is best <laughs> left on the cutting room floor but um, it kind of ended up becoming a lot more of a straight musical this time which I was at first a little w- wary of but I've kind of I've kind of come to terms with it um, it definitely feels like much more of a piece this one whereas I feel like the last one was almost like a review show yeah, I know what you mean that there was a sense of sketches and songs being I've, married together whereas this has this coherent narrative which is not to say the previous one didn't yeah. but this narrative works has several levels and, uh, well here's an interesting I found it very hard to take songs out of context from this one and perform them uh, as spots or in you know, or in cabaret yeah, yeah. yeah so that it's been a lot I mean I have done it but it's been a lot harder to do this time Without um, some explanation, I yeah, you do have to do a little bit of uh, a bit of uh, scene setting to begin with. Whereas the last one had a couple more that you could just take as a just a standalone, self-contained thing. But there's lots of cleverness in the piece as well. Um, the the villain of the piece, the the jock, seems mm. to have two songs. I would say is yes. his uh, military march, yes. which actually, funny enough, you know, we as Brits would look upon what we've learned about the American education system, we would expect someone like that perhaps also to be in the cadets or some mm. kind of military aspect. There's also that kind of square one-two aspect you get with a, a Sousa March kind of thing, which sums him up because he's not a man of great depth, is he? No. He's a jock and nothing else. He's nothing he has else. hidden shallows, as they say. Yeah. Um, and then later on, when he's a villain, he's got a fantastic... He's got a song later on where he's trying to sort of um, oppress everyone, if you like. Yeah. Um, and you must tell me, because I'm not musically minded, but it appeared to me to be fairly... Um, 
square beat as well. Very. You know, you know he's yes. not a man who's going to fall into a waltz, is he? No, no, no. Uh, I wanted to keep the march feel. Um, because the, the military march, like, it is a sort of slightly aggressive, militaristic American sound, but it's also got a kind of um, sophomore sort of... Or yeah. what's... Is that the word I'm looking for? The kind of college... Well, fraternity thing. Frat, frat, frat yeah, thing, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. This kind of college band sound, which I quite like, which I wanted to give him. And then the later incarnation of it um, is a sort of variation on the same theme, but it's all strings. There's nothing other than strings, which was a slightly... Um, I wanted to put a nod towards slasher flicks, which is another high school genre a lot of the time. Well, of course, yes, absolutely. Let's all go and camp in the woods. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and I've been very much enjoying the Netflix uh, Scream series, which is on at the moment, um, which is has a lot, which has a gorgeous soundtrack of just string quartet, and it's beautiful. It's like Bernard Herrmann. Um, as in the the Hitchcock yeah, it sounds, some note, yes yeah. I mean, it sounds a lot like Psycho so that's kind of what I wanted to bring in there I like the fact you delineate your characters with their song as well mm. I, uh, forgive me and um, there's the, the bad girl song early on okay. um, I tell you who I was getting sounds and you must tell me if I'm wrong or right but um, I, I, I got a strange mixture of Peggy Lee and Julie London oh, they that kind of sort of these are way. all of the right words <laughs> yes well I know Frank Sinatra actually turns up for a good second yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Peggy Lee and Julie London were pretty much the go-to yeah. reference points for that song. Interestingly, with that character, her name is May, and she originally was going to sound and be exactly like May West. But I found uh, her voice too difficult to differentiate because you know she's all like that. Yeah. Come, uh, on, come on, shimmy sometime. Exactly. But so it's, it does turn into Mrs. Slocum. Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> and it's also a little close to... when In my voice, it doesn't sound female enough. So I had, I had to make a more of a kind of like Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors kind of uh, sound. That was the only way I could think of to... Because there's more girls in this one. Yes. Which is hard. And I can't help but notice, like, you know, I've done intensive research and I mm. spotted that you're not one. Yes, it's yeah. Th- this is um, a, a thing which I keep doing... And not really being aware of my own limitations, so I, um, so yeah, so I made her that sort of New York kind of sassy broad, yeah. and then the the she other. Could actually, be the Elaine Stritch character if they're yeah. a lot older. Yes, <laughs> and the other the the sort of the popular girl. I decided to go in the other direction and make her English and base her on like a kind of English rich kid, yeah. just purely to differentiate between them. And then there's the, the, the weird shy girl who <laughs> I just was the first time I've ever put a character into falsetto. Because I don't quite like doing that because it yeah. seems like a kind of crass way of... Well, you can fall into Monty Python. You can. Yeah, it's a kind of, quite a crass way of implying gender. But I thought for her, because she's so sort of frail, yes. it, it kind of works. Well, actually, yes, because it wasn't shrill. She was very gentle. Also. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's how she is. There's, um, there's a danger of falling into the Muppet zone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I kind of... It's funny you say that, but um, I sort of was thinking of her as a bit of a Muppet character. <laughs> I thought maybe she could be a glove puppet of some description. If you were doing a live... If uh, I was doing a... a, a, a full cast, yeah, yeah, yeah. She Maybe she could be a puppet. I mean, obviously, she started off weirder as well. She started off being genuinely odd. In an early incarnation of it, she was going to speak entirely in Japanese. <laughs> I was going to have surtitles... Um, yeah, you like to set yourself a challenge. I do, you? and yeah, that was a step to. No, excellent. My mum, uh, my mum <laughs> speaks a bit of Japanese, so I was going to get her to um, to sort of do a translation up, for yes. me. Yeah, and then I'd have to learn it phonetically and 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 have surtitles on a sort of scrolling screen or something. But we decided that wouldn't work, either comedically or or musically. So. Uh, well, it's setting oneself a very high hurdle, isn't it? It is, for, for it is. Result. I really like what you do with her. I also like, actually, if you don't mind me saying, the observation that, you know, she's denounced as weird and introspective. But in fact, it's actually because she's almost hollow, really. It's in fact yeah. that she's bland. I mean, she has that fantastic song. That is a great song. Thank and you. And a marvellous piece of observation about that kind of character. A lot of people are forced into being weird or reclusive because they fall outside the society. Well, she just society doesn't norms, fit yeah. into any category. That yeah. was the idea I wanted to convey with so her. So she's regressed into herself. Yeah, right? But so it doesn't make her fascinating. Yeah, it makes, a, yeah. It makes a, a, yeah, an outcast almost because she's... A, I kind of feel like a little bit like that on the fringe. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really feel like I'm comedy, uh, particularly like as such, 
I suppose it's a, I suppose what I the category I fall most neatly into is just musicals. But I don't feel like I'm, I'm not comedy, I'm not cabaret, I'm not theatre, I'm not really anything. If you but, had uh, more legs, you would straddle them all. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> a kind foot of. In each camp, I, yeah. yeah, I sort of do. But, but, uh, I, don't, yeah. but I, like, I love what you produce. I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, the synthesis mm. of quality musical writing. I mean, your lyrics are better than some of the lyrics in High School Musical. In fact, they're not all the lyrics. Well, that's I very kind you of you. said you haven't seen it, but there, are, there is a song called Off to the Top. Is there? Where in order to make the rhymes work, they have to insert <laughs> the word mop. Because there's, <laughs> and there's very few ways of making that sound natural. Bop to the right? top. Yeah, yeah it's classic. Bop like a mop. Bop because like a mop. Those famous mopping bops. Yeah, they, they, they love to bop, yeah. those mops. Um, and in fairness, without ruining anything, there is a mop There in is a piece, prominent but I, mop but in I'm the guessing show. But that's not a subliminal message to those people who are lovers of those lyrics. I mean, if it is, it's extremely subliminal, <laughs> given that I've never even seen it. It is worth watching with a bottle of wine, I think, and a good no, film. Right, OK, um, yeah, one of those films. Yes, okay. very much so. Um, but yeah, the lyrics are half the fun, if I may say. Thank you. Um, but your lyrics are actually, they're so ingenious as well. Um, in the um, the Nerds number, where he's, for some reason he managed to digress, he digresses into the history and the, of evolution. Yes, way. yes. Um, you rhyme human with improvement. But you yeah. Do it, yeah, yeah, just about. Just but about. Uh, you do it with such a lamb. Right. Actually, it's, 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 you smooth over. I mean, there's a lot of craft in your work, but right. also you know when to get a comedy rhyme in for, for effect. Uh -huh. I mean, you aren't really, forgive me, you're a quintessential professional. It's, and, Thank and you, you. You knew that before you arrived here, but um, it's lovely seeing it on stage. There's oh, more craft in your one-man show than I've seen in quite a lot of full cast musicals this year. Wow, that's very, very encouraging. I'll no, write them down on the list and give them to you for a tenner <laughs> if you like. <laughs> nice. So, um, you were talking about the length of time it took to develop it. So, mm. About six months, I think you said in total. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, well, that's sort of not including having the idea in September, which we then sort of just settled on and Rested. then went, great, let's think about that in months to come. Um, but yes, it, it, it certainly took a lot longer to figure out this one than the last one. I think because the la in the last show I had the freedom to sort of crash yeah. fairly kind of beautifully clumsily between different genres of film which was, so, fun. Which was yeah, yeah. kind of most of the fun of it um, but this one because it's all in one place it's almost all in one room um, in fact it is I think all in one room uh, it, that was harder so it had to be more character driven and that's not really something that I feel particularly uh, you know confident in whereas Lindsay my wife uh, is a novelist so she was very help um, a lot more confident in that department she knows how to delineate she knows how to make characters sort of believable and, and sympathetic and interesting so uh, so yeah it was a lot more of a collaborative process this one but you mustn't undersell yourself because mm -hmm. you very kindly and quite rightly praised your wife for helping with the, uh, the text and the narrative and mm. you praised um, I can't remember who it was but your, the person who helped you with your movement oh yes these are all fantastic things but actually on the stage um, you have a great physical presence um, you do adopt the poses of each of the characters there was no question of merging I don't think there would have been any point during that performance when I didn't know who you were being at right. that point point. Okay. let's not forget there's also two or three cameos yes. from people from real life yes. um, and their fictional counterparts yes. in the piece rather fantastically brilliantly in fact and so many musical jokes as well I mean forgive me uh, there's a quick um, John Williamsy sting at the appropriate yes. moment when a John Williamsy sting seems good should be yes. yes and it creeps in you know the dialogue is setting it up without anyone realising it and then you suddenly you could hear the audience with their pennies dropping or you could when like, the day I was in I don't know if you've spotted that yes busy they normally drop at about the same point normally yep. what happens is you get one nerd on their own yep. who gets it immediately then like three more nerds slightly less yep. nerds and then by the time everyone's got it you've got through to the people who aren't nerds the connection yeah, yeah and it's, it's nice to see and every time the first nerd goes I sort of feel like yeah you're my people <laughs> you, you are you are you're, you're me in this scenario but as I say physicality is so good you know, for example the, uh, the bad girl mm. she's constantly holding a cigarette so yes. you, but you just hold sort of two fingers in a nonchalant cigarette holding way yeah. and, you've, and you've sort of that character is conjured up yeah. you also move I mean like, you as you very kindly said, you know, you've been helped with that. Mm. But physically, that, that really helps. You're, you delineate the characters. Their voices, I don't just mean accents, I mean their narrative voices are different. The characters are different. Their journeys are sufficiently intermeshed but distinctive. Mm. And then you have this physicality about it, which um, 
I, as I say, I think it's pretty much impeccable, to be honest. Oh, that's very kind. Um, Thank you. Even down to some of the small details. I'm going to ask you a question I wouldn't normally ask a gentleman in public. Go for it. But I couldn't help but notice, in order to show that it was a, a modern high school, Yes. you were wearing your pants very highly out of the back of your pants. Yes, yes. I'm assuming this was a um, costume choice. Um, costume. It is partly to some extent. Um, I mean, you wouldn't normally do that in the street. I probably wouldn't, although Good. I have uh, lost quite a lot of weight, this fringe, um, <laughs> from running around. So, to some extent, that is possibly my belt well, being just, just pattern, too yeah. loose. But, yeah, that's not it. That's not... It's sort of... Oh, let's say that's 50% intentional. I like that. <laughs> it just helps weave a context. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how's it being received? Um, it's being received very well by audiences. Um, every bit as well as last year which is great and I was really worried that the the thing that I'd always hear was oh yeah I loved the last show this one was good but I really loved the last show and thankfully that hasn't been happening I've actually even had a few people saying they prefer this one which is a big relief well I do if you don't mind me saying I actually do think it's a slightly more assured production right. I really do oh, that's uh, interesting which is not to say that I think last year I thought last year was fantastic mm. um, but it would be difficult to see where to go and you've actually found exactly the right place to go right and exactly the right way to do that that's great. Yeah. Right. I'm looking forward to the third album. Oh, well, I do have an idea. Oh, good. Oh, yes. Don't I, tell me yet. Obviously. Okay, I won't tell you yet. You may have to take the Japanese elements out. Yes, <laughs> yeah, no, I have a pretty, I have a, I think I know what I'm doing next year-ish, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that for now. <laughs> but you were able to take Sydney musicals on the road, weren't you, after the last day? A little bit, yes. yes. Um, I, I, it went I think to, you came as far as Acton. I did, <laughs> yes. Uh, it, 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 went, it was at the St. James Theatre. Um, I did a sh I did a, a small run for uh, the Funny Side Comedy Club in uh, Soho, uh, and yeah, a few others here and there. It, it hasn't hasn't really been shelved yet, and I am doing it. I've been doing a short run up here of that show um, in the bigger room in the Voodoo rooms upstairs. Just After on a sit down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, there's about six hours in between each one. A Lucas Aid and a rest. Yes, definitely. Um, <laughs> But uh, so that yeah, so I'm still I'm still sort of trotting that one around. I think I'll probably put that on the back bench um, after after this fringe for a while and plug this one for a bit and do a few more. I think I have a few um, London dates for this show uh, lined up in the autumn, and then I'll start cracking on with the next one. I think. And I have to ask you: Do you think you could ever do? A one-act thing is a marvellous thing, but you've now got two in your repertoire. Mm. Could, it, could you physically do Act 1 cine musicals, Act 2 cine musical style? I think I, I, I could do. I, no, I, I think it would be physically possible to do. Um, I, I wonder how well they'd fit as a double bill, because they're kind of... It's a sort of spiritual sequel, this one. It is. And the, the, the mood of it is very similar, and kind of even the, the sort of narrative of it is, is quite similar. So I don't know... I don't know whether they'd work as a double bill. I'd love to try it to see if it does. Um, and which order would you do them in? That's a very good question. I think I'd probably start with this one. Do you know? I think you'd be right to do And that. then do last year's one second because it, because it's sort of bigger and more fantastical. It's the second from the constraint to the expansive. To the expansive. Yeah. I think it would be a mistake to go the other direction. Yeah. And um, traditionally in musical theatre, we're just looking at the normal tropes. The second act often is a little looser than the first act. Yeah, anyway, yes, isn't it? yes. Most of the plot points have gone into the first <laughs> act in some yeah, senses. Yeah. So I think you're travelling a well trodden path. I think so, well. I think so. Um, you've recorded an album, of course, of I your have. great songs. There's one or two items on it which are from the cutting room floor or yes. rejected ideas. So you've already mentioned the Japanese sequence, I don't think that's on the uh, That, the that didn't make it to a record. So, so what, what has gone from your final product, there, if you don't mind me asking? Um, about a verse from every single song, so they all had a bit of a haircut. Um, there's a couple of guitar bits which were going to be little interludes, which there just wasn't time for, so I've cut them, but they're on the album. Very uh, Michael J. Fox all that one. Yeah, yeah, back definitely. To the, back to the Future is my high school film exactly like, now that me precisely from that yeah so the, the my jeans and shoes combo is yeah. kind of basically Michael J Fox um, <laughs> yes you're in the denim aren't yeah, you? yeah the double denim was a deliberate choice uh, but also the opening number whereas in the current show it's about three and a half minutes on the album it's closer to eight minutes Crikey. so in the opening the original opening had all of the characters being introduced one by one um, but we, it just proved a little too much for the top of a friend show. It's also quite a big sweet to swallow, isn't it? Yes, it is. Like a big lozenge. Yeah. <laughs> so then we put the the 
so in in the current incarn live incarnation of it, they t uh, there's a register uh, which. Oh yes, you, that's how you introduce everybody. Exactly. So that's how we got around that. Um, but yeah, on the album, the full version is there with all of the uh, all of their, and they each get a little bit of their music sort of foreshadowed in the opening thing. So that's on the album as well. How very fugue like. No, no, <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. So that sounds well marvellous. And was there anything else that you've sort of... Was, was, once again, I have to ask you, was there a character that, that was in originally and was gone? Or were you pretty much there from all, your stereotypes at the beginning? Yeah, all of the characters are... Um, I haven't cut any characters, uh, whereas I did with the last one. I remember. Um, but, so no, all of, all of the characters that were going to be there are now in there. But, uh, but yeah, it's just a lot more sort of music that got lost and, and dialogue. Um, that's been sort of shortened, but uh, yeah, but a lot of that is on the record, so it hasn't been lost entirely. So for those of us who are Lawrence Owen collectors, then you can still hear it. Um, if people want to buy the album, or they want to find out where it's going on, and your own personal website, yes, I, I remember you have more than one. I think I do. I have a composer website, which is lawrenceowen.co.uk. That's Lawrence with a U. Isn't Lawrence it? with a U. And that is, that's sort of, uh, that's more about my sort of day job, in inverted commas. Uh, all of this stuff you can find the information about on my comedy website, which is mrlawrenceowen.com. That's M-R, mrlawrenceowen.com. And you can buy everything, you can listen to clips, you can find YouTube videos, etc., etc. Have a good old wallow and explore. Have a good old stalk. <laughs> now, Lawrence, it's always fun talking to you. It's nice talking to someone who really knows what they're doing and presents and performs so beautifully and writes so wonderfully. Um, and it's just lovely seeing your show. So thank you. please, thank you for talking to me. A pleasure. Please bring that third show up. I will, I will, I will. On any normal school day, I wouldn't look your way Unless it was to whip you with my towel or call you gay And the moment I arrived here, I looked at you and knew There's a million different ways in which it sucks to be you I wanna build a wall to keep you all Away from me and all the other strong, tough, cool guys Men who like things physical They kick your asses every day, they're just like me in every way if you're not a macho icon, then it sucks to be you If you're not from right where I'm from, then it sucks to be you If you ain't no good at soccer, then your head will meet your locker So it probably sucks to be you I mean, just take a look at yourselves, you bunch of losers For instance, you, you're kinda hot, but better see to never hurt Bet this weedy douchebag loses every fight cause he's a nerd You're a trashy hoe who's probably got daddy issues too And you're so freaking weird that it just sucks to be you It sucks to be you It sucks to be you Thank you so much. It's written down in Genesis that men are great and women only paved the way for terrorists and feminists, degenerates and Mexicans and goddamn homosexicans. If you're not an independent, then it sucks to be you. If you hate the Second Amendment, then it sucks to be you. If you give more than you take, and you don't eat lots of steak, then it probably sucks to be you. So if you wanna get somewhere, you gotta be a man And that consists of shoving losers' heads down in the pan It's survival of the fittest, there's just no making do With all the million different ways in which it sucks to be you It really sucks so freaking much to be you Musical talk that's Lawrence Owen, and I enjoy conversations with him. He has a bubbling wit and a great sense of humour which comes forward in everything that we talk about. And his show was an absolute must-see. And that means if you can see it now, even though Edinburgh is finished, because it is on the road, please do so. Remember, do go along to his websites to get further details. I called his show Hilarious and Clever, a genuine gem of the fringe. And so too, I think, is Lawrence. It was a five-star show. And just for the record, the music and lyrics were by Lawrence Owen, and the story was by Lawrence and Lindsay Sharman, with live movement direction by Kitty Winter. Do pop along to www.mrlawrenceowen.com, and the complete score of that show is available. 
We've heard Average Movie High School Day, which was the opening number, and we also heard It Sucks to Be You, the song by The Jock, which we discussed in the conversation. And later in the programme, we'll have a chance to hear one more number from that impressive score. Now, in her day, Dolly Parton has had some massive hits. And you do have to be tremendously careful how you say that. I don't want to give the wrong impression. But Dolly Parton is a tremendously talented person. And of course, she's had forays into musical theatre. The most famous of which being the musicalised version of the film, and indeed her song, Nine to Five. It's a musical set in 1979, and in a light-hearted and comic way, portrays the struggle of talented women in the workplace in an age when sexism was rife. Most of the musical takes place in an office environment, but it's nothing at all like the great office musical How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. It is its own piece. And certainly, until it came out, there were very few musicals that touched country and western style songs. So for our next conversation, you're going to hear from Kieran Walsh. He's a composer and an actor, and we've chatted with him in the past about a previous show that he'd brought up to Edinburgh. But now he can claim to be, quite rightly, a professional actor, having come through the Royal Scottish Conservatoire. And he played Franklin Hart Jr., the odious sexist boss, who very much suffers at the hands of the women he puts down in his own office environment. And Kieran will also be talking about Confessions of a Justified Songwriter, which is a new musical which comically looks at the real-life situation of songwriters in the pop industry. It was quite the eye-opener for me, and both were great shows. So let's not waste any more time, and let's get straight on with that conversation with Kieran about Confessions of a Justified Songwriter and 9 to 5 by Dolly Parton. Musical talk. Well, Kieran, it's a Hi. real joy and a delight to see you again here in Edinburgh because this is where we met a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And I know musical talk listeners with uh, long memories will remember you as a composer. Y- yeah, of... I um, started off a couple of years back in second year of university with a crazy idea of taking a musical to the fringe for the first time, which I'd, I wrote the music and revised the book for. And um, it was a hell of a project, so I ended up MDing, directing, and doing quite a lot to do with the project, really. So um, that was all a very sort of creative team side of things, and it was um, it was a really rewarding experience. But I remember thinking at the time, you know, why am I not on that stage? I've got <laughs> so much energy, and everyone has always said to me, you know, you're born for the stage in one form or another. And I was like, why am I behind the scenes in this? And so the next year of my life, I started just change of career, and I thought, yeah, I think... I really do want to be in musicals, and here we are two years later. But in a way, though, starting off with a musical and then doing almost all the other aspects of it must help inform your stagecraft, because, you know, Mm. we all know that putting on a show is a collaborative effort, and you've actually been round the block on quite a few of the jobs now. Absolutely. So as an actor, you can see what the... I'm going to call the technical side I, do and the musical side, etc. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's definitely true, but um, it does have its shortcomings, though. For example, I have to be very careful not to um, backseat MD, because, um, yeah. you know, the temptation, obviously, <laughs> if you're given creative reign over a role, yet, you know, you, you are doing the job, but on the other hand, it's their job to advise you. And, you know, you can't then say, oh, I don't like that, because yeah. it's... That's their bit. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> is, that's yeah. their bit. So it's kind of finding that balance, and I think it is really fun and actually quite useful to be able to look into lots of dis- different aspects. And I think, especially in this day and age, you want to be, in terms of graduating and moving on to real-world jobs, you want to be as employable yes. as possible. So to be able to say, oh, yeah, I've, I've done some set design, I've done some lighting, the very basic level, you know, but but more than many. Oh, well, it's more than some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yes. uh, yeah um, and obviously musical direction and composition is always incredibly useful because then they can go, oh, okay, so this person can do a bit of, I don't know, a bit of arranging for us on the side, which, you know, I could in theory, but obviously I won't toot my own horn. I mean, I, I do. I enjoy it. I do it for the love yeah. of it. Um, obviously, the hope is that one day it learn me some dosh. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that's how we'll everyone, about isn't that. it? <laughs> but um, forgive me. We'll talk about your acting career in just a second. But you mm-hmm. do keep your finger in with the writing, even if you haven't had much chance to do that. Presumably, you know, you do, do you still consider yourself to be a composer yeah, as well as an actor? Very much so, actually. For this year, because I've just finished off my masters at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, mm. I've been basically going 
I'm an actor for this year, I'm performing and such and such, yeah. and going full on, okay, what do I need to do? My dancing needs better, my acting <laughs> needs training, all of these things, and prioritising. But in my spare time, I am, I've also been working on a show called White Feathers, oh, which yes. is about the white feather women of World War One. Now, the credit for this has to go to Hannah Ward-Jones, who is a dear friend of mine, and she's also a colleague on my in my cohort. And uh, she approached me with a play that she'd written based on several scenes in France in the aftermath of World War One, or in some cases prior to, and sort of the white fe- the feather women and how they were involved in it. And I thought it was really interesting. There was some really gritty stuff there. So we started looking at possibly which of these stories we could take and maybe turn into a musical. And then it became clear about two months into my master's that students could apply to write a musical for the coming Fringe. And I was like, that's perfect. Yes. Let's see if we can get it together. So we got some demos down. We got a basic script together. Um, unfortunately, they didn't go with it this year on the basis that it wasn't quite ready. We didn't have the yeah. time to finish it, whereas an external director or writer would have time of to course, come in yeah. and work on it. Um, it was, however... Uh, put aside in favour of Confessions of a Justified Songwriter. On which we'll discuss in a minute, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, a a really good show has come of it. So as far as we're concerned, it's still very much alive. We're going to keep trying to work it and um, see if anyone's interested. I think it's an interesting story because, funnily enough, it's almost one of the few properly untold stories of the First World War still. Mm. I mean, people are aware of the White Feather Ladies and women, as you've said, Mm. and there's a strong connection with the suffragettes. Mm -hmm. That often surprises people. But the suffragette movement was a great White Feather movement as well Mm. uh, to show how much into the establishment they were and therefore not a threat. So there's lots going on there and that's actually, you know, it's quite surprising Mm. stuff. So I think this has the potential yeah well thank you very much i think the interesting thing about it for me is that they honestly felt like at the time they were really helping the war effort by handing out these war and um, handing out these white feathers and basically blackmailing people and saying you're a coward you're, guilt you're trip, not fighting guilt yeah. trip yeah mm. but it was the idea that we're helping you know we're sending men off to the war to go and fight for us when actually they're just making everything worse because mm. those who are already demoralised by having lost people in the war will just be brought down even further. Our story actually is interesting in that it starts off with a, a woman of the age of about 20 and her brother has just gone out to war and died. Uh-huh. And so we see her opening letters that he's sent and he appears in ghost form singing the letters and so you have an interesting staging there where you can sort of see him. It's a bit like Next to Normal, yes. where the mother can see um, Gabe and no one else can. Um, well, it's Billy Elliot as well, in that well, sense. I'm not, well, trying, exactly. to, I'm not trying to um, <laughs> uh, cheapen it in any way, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 a, good, it's a method. It's yes. a good device, yeah. yeah. And I think I, I really like it in terms of staging because it, it allows you to do so much poetically with um, what's going on. And uh, I think the interesting thing here is that she then becomes a white feather woman to help with the war effort and send more guys oh, over right. because they say, don't be sad that your brother's lost. Give your life meaning. And so they basically, <laughs> yeah. the white feather women come and take her into their arms and she then falls in love with a conscientious objector. So oh, see, you're adding some nice mess. Ah, so a, a nice an, emotional mess here. Yeah, so there's quite. an interesting love triangle that goes on between the brother, Thomas, um, Alf, the conscientious objector. So the brother, Thomas, who's obviously dead but yeah, alive quite. to her. And uh, then Eleanor herself, who is just going through all of this turmoil and trying to work out what she actually wants and what is going to help. So I think, yeah, obviously Hannah could tell you in much yeah. more detail about the plot, and I'm sure she'd love well, to. Well, I'm sure we stage. can. I'm sure we can talk about that in the future, that actually, as great. it starts to develop. But that's a little. That's yeah. a little look into the future. But I'm very pleased to hear that you're still composing. Mm-hmm. I just like, you know, the fact that your creativity is coming out in lots of different areas. But Thank this you. year, as you've quite rightly yeah. said, the focus is very much on being the actor. Absolutely. And you're in two shows up here in Edinburgh this year. Yes. One, a well-known show, you know, that's been on in Broadway in London, I think. Mm-hmm. And one, a piece of new writing, a devised piece. So let's talk about the well-known show first. Yes. Where you have a significant role, <laughs> uh, a literal uh, part of a cliffhanger almost. So certainly a suspense ending at the end of Act One, which we'll yeah. discuss in a minute. <laughs> But we're talking about Dolly Parton's 9 to 5. Yes. The stage version of a well-known film by her. Mm-hmm. And crammed full of Dolly Parton songs. Mm-hmm. And you have a big role in this. Yeah, I um, I basically play the egotistical boss. You're who, the big bad, really, aren't uh, you? Yeah, I'm the big bad wolf. And he is 
He is a complex character in one sense because you could look at him as a one-dimensional villain. He's just hateful and angry, but he's actually, essentially an old-fashioned misogynist in the Mad Men yes, uh, mold. But that's with, exactly, but without possibly the charm. Interesting, you should say Mad Men because Patricia Resnick, who actually wrote the book for Nine to Five, is also heavily involved in the writing of Mad Men. Oh right! So she's quite I didn't know that. adept at that oh. era of writing. Yeah. So Come the on. interesting thing about him, I think he could be one-dimensional. And he could just be this sort of angry man. But I think the really interesting thing is that he doesn't think anything he does is wrong. He's been raised on this belief that women are inferior to him and that he can get what he wants by yelling at people and just Mm. doing. And I think he's a bully, but he's been created a bully. hasn't Yeah. Yeah, And he genuinely like there's a moment where he says, I don't deserve to be treated like this. And there's an interesting argument where on the one hand, he could be manipulating the women around him. But on the other hand. He genuinely believes that. He doesn't think he deserves it because he just thinks, you know, I just tap you on the bum because it's playful. You know, I, I don't really mean it. You know? And it is set in 1979. When, exactly. When whilst those attitudes were certainly uh, not acceptable, they no. had been acceptable so much more recently. Well, exactly. But it was easy to be a, a throwback or a dinosaur. Mm. How do you as a, 21st, a thoroughly 21st century <laughs> man relate or find something? I mean, it's, you've been talking about the fact you're quite right. He doesn't see himself as a villain. He, you know, mm-hmm. everyone is the hero of their own story. Yeah. How do you find yourself finding your own connections with a man who is not just of the last century, but in social um, terms, even further back almost than that? Well, you only have to look in the news, headline Trump, to yeah, sort of well, see quite. that things haven't changed all that much, as much as we might like to think. I'm not going to go all political on this, mm. but he's been quite a large influence on me in terms of modernising this role because of the fact that actually nothing has changed in in the business aspect of the world, there is still this horrific glass ceiling and misogyny. And it is it's something which really does need to change because I think there is an element to which, you know, there is more concern with equal pay and there's equal rights going on and there's the Everyday Sexism Project, um, which sort of explore all these ideas of how to treat women in the workplace. They, they are just as equal to men in every sense of the word. And the thing is, when someone as cartoonish as Trump comes out and says the things he says... It really draws a parallel between the two things. But can I ask you a question? Let's mm-hmm. take us back to Frank Hart. Mm. Is Frank Hart a misogynist, and using the strict terminology here, a hater of women, or is he merely a, I say merely, but or is he <laughs> merely a sexist in the sense of he simply thinks they're inferior and not worth worrying about? Now, I, it's possible we can get into semantics about whether that overlaps or not. I but don't... there is a difference. Mm. Does he hate women? He's not married, is he? He doesn't hate women. He just objectifies them. Yes, he, he does. He sees them yeah. as objects to entertain. Oh. Uh, which is just horrific. He doesn't see the implications of what he does in that sense that the, the gravitas of what he does actually has an implication and, you know, things can go wrong. So how do you lighten him to make him... Because he has to have that function comedy. in the piece. Yes, I was going to say, but you also have to... You have to do something. Mm-hmm. And indeed, I was going to say comedy is very much the path you take. But there's a very great piece of physical comedy at the end of Act One where, without giving anything away... You use your own personal physicality to get the audience to laugh. Mm-hmm. I think there are elements to which he is restrained in both body and mind, <laughs> pun intended. And he, uh, I think there's a desperation to his character. When he's out of control, he's really out of control. And when these women are succeeding and basically winning the game that he's been playing, mm. you know, he loses it. And it becomes very entertaining to play a status game and just see how low you can take his status in that moment. Make him big, make him cartoonish, and suddenly it makes him look extremely weak. Which well, I think. Could I just say, in narrative terms, I actually like the fact that they don't just beat him at his own game; that they then go on to change the game. Yeah, I, I think that's the secret for the uh, the female characters. Well, I suppose that's the injection of feminism into the musical, really, because on the surface, it's not like a massive feminist piece it doesn't go out to make that deliberate statement but what it does do is it looks at the changes in perspective that were going on in the 1980s and this, this sort of shift um, yeah because it's written in the 80s wasn't it mm, or the film was 19, uh, yeah 1980 it was released it was and written set, in 78 set in 79 yes. yeah and basically it's that cusp of that time when um, women couldn't divorce a husband but a husband could leave on any grounds without having to provide any evidence. So there was this sudden shift when the Divorce Act of... 
oh, my research is failing me, 1970-something um, came in when suddenly women had the power to leave their husbands. What is this basically... in America? Yeah, it was yeah. in America. So I, don't what... think, I don't think that's the case in this country. But no, yeah, no. Yeah. Um, so, it, but it, it had echoes across the world. But in, in America, sorry, I should, I should add. Where this is set. Yeah, it's ex- exactly. There was this sort of epidemic of women who were trapped in marriages where they were treated very poorly by their husbands. But because of the marital licensing at the time when they got married, they couldn't leave mm. under really any circumstances. So they were just putting up with abuse. And there were all sorts of women's magazines about, um, you know, just uh, making yourself look nice and doing all of the yeah. stereotypical things that we've tried to fight against in modern day society. You know, they were just like, ignore the the bad yeah. stuff in your life and move on and try and think on the positive side. Whereas the feminists at that time who uh, started things like M Magazine and started to look at, um, Ms, sorry, um, started to look at, you know, the realities of what these women were facing. So there was like a front, front cover where um, a woman had been uh, subject to domestic mm. abuse and she was featured on the front cover of a magazine selling all over the country. And suddenly it's this big change of, you know what, we're not going to stand and take this anymore. And that, in a pinch, is what this whole show's about. It's about that change of perspective. It's not necessarily preaching feminism. It's just it uses comedy to look at the way in which we can change society by sort of taking life by the balls, really. Tell me about the score of 9 to 5. The score's cracking. Um, Obviously, it's Dolly Parton. Oh, yes. Well, um, so the base layer is Dolly Parton. It's... um, A series of songs, obviously 9 to 5. Which was an enormous hit at the time in the hit parade regardless. Exactly, and that was mostly, um, that was partly due to the popularity of the film, uh, for which it was, I'm not sure if it was written for the film or produced with the film, but it came out at the same time, so they helped each other. Um, And so the whole score is inflected with this kind of um, jazzy, folksy country feel to it, and they use that motif throughout the kind of dun, bun, bun, dun, dun, throughout the whole yes, it, it's, score. Yes, it, it's, it's it smuggled in to quite a lot mm-hmm. of songs, which helps actually give you an integrated score in some mm-hmm. senses. And I think about, just to give you a bit more yeah. detail on the score, uh, it was arranged and orchestrated by Stephen Aremus, who did Wild Party, Wicked. Oh, right. Uh, and he's, he's done lots of things. He's basically... They don't all have to begin with W, though. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> no. Um, but he's Broadway's man for hire yes. at the moment, and he's, he's fantastic. He's a known talent, yeah. Yeah, he, he finds a really interesting way to fuse quite um, an extensive range of jazz styles with um, the classic musical theatre... Um, sentiment of making a point not park and bark necessarily with the exception of the song Get Out and Stay Out for those Mm. who know the musical where she really is making a point and she sings and belts her tits off Um, and it's uh, (laughs) delicately put my love very delicately put I'm sorry I'm still in character Um, and yeah I think it's uh, just one of those interesting things where it's it's quite a complex score in that sense but it's it's simple enough that you can go on a journey with it and it just services the plot perfectly um, I really like it. It's good fun. There's one song that particularly stands out to me because it's the inverse of the song Nine to Five, actually, which is sung by Roz, who's a bit of sort of a, a comic villainess. Yes, exactly. Mm. It's the because it's 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 a literal inverse in the sense that Nine to Five is all about hating the hours you're at work and and her hours that she doesn't like are the ones when she's away from work. Mm. And it's actually it's a very short song, mm. um, and I. I just thought it was very subtle and clever. Well, I mean, it's a very obvious thing to do, just inverse a song. Mm-hmm. But actually, I really liked that because suddenly it also gave that character, who's a bit of a caricature. Yeah. You know, she's in love with you and your character. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, she's a sort of, um, yeah, she's a very odd, devoted, loyal character in, in, in a way that perhaps yeah. she shouldn't be. But she sings this, it's plaintive. It sort of actually gives her a bit of um, depth, which I think is not necessarily uh, there in the narrative. So I, I like that particularly. Mm. Um, there is a danger, of course, when everything, particularly country, which is not something that's often featured in musical theatre, mm. um, when everything is country-ish, it's not all country, but it's country-ish, mm. infused in that Dolly parton way, of course yeah. it is, um, it can begin to sound a little bit similar because yeah. there is something about that genre which is so distinctive. Mm. I would say, though, that for this score... There is an element of similarity throughout it when you sort of you recognise bits coming back and it yeah. has that pop inflection, that country sort of yodel, if you like, throughout it. But that's also because, you know, you have the character of Dora Lee who literally represents Dolly Parton yeah. herself she on stage singing. Couldn't, well, Dolly Parton more or less says so in her recorded well, inserts at the beginning, yeah, exactly, doesn't she? Yeah. Yes. Um, and the thing 
The thing is, like, it could have that element of um, sameness, if you like. But, I mean, take Bright Star, which mm. has just opened up on Broadway. That uses a hell of a lot of country influence. And it's uh, Steve Martin wrote the book and score, I think. Um, well, Broadway's becoming a much broader canvas anyway. But yeah. I suspect in the 80s it was still... Um, oh, yes. This, this was quite... Sondheim was the one to really break boundaries back in the 80s. But, um, in, but in terms of using different genre in, um, you know, breaking Broadway out into sort of genre like country, you, I'm sure it has been done before, had been done before, but this is sort of, if you like, the breakthrough, it seems to me, or so I understand. Yeah. But, you know, this is the one that came along and was the big success. Mm. Just to finish on this, um, oh, yes. we've had several five-star reviews and four-star reviews, and it's um, very good. it's been really well received, and generally the overwhelming... Um, feedback that we've had is that as a company there is a hell of a lot of research gone on I can obviously back this up yes. given that we did do a lot of research into who the characters were but every person on stage has an absolute reason to be there they have relationships and you can see the life on the stage which is more than well, just a... react to what's going on yeah. with the leads, you know, and it, it has that vivacious life to it. It has the bustle of an office as well. And bearing in mind, a exactly. lot of it is set in an office. The choreography yeah. by Paul Smethurst, um, it sort of really reflects that, actually. And the set, um, which is just absolutely brilliant. And it really encapsulates that idea of just a busy office with no well, time. I think I can say it looks like a series of cupboards and um, storage facilities, yes. but which then can cleverly sort of... Be, it's sufficiently modular that you can take elements out of it yeah. and build parts of the set with it, which is rather lovely. Which is rather fun. So the other show. Yes, the other show, which are also featuring in a significant role in. Oh, well, I'd, I'd say. So it's, it's fairly equal footing, really. Oh, yes, it's an show. ensemble piece. Yes. But, you know, um, everyone has a chance to shine, I think, in mm. that sense. Um, and this is Confessions of a Justified Songwriter? Yes. So it's a part devised piece, partly in the sense that um, we've been working with John and Jerry Keelty, who famously wrote Wasted Love, which um, won several awards back in 2011 at the Fringe. And indeed, they've written various other new writing shows mm -hmm. for the, uh, the Royal Scottish Conservatoire and its yes. predecessor name. <laughs> yes, so they are uh, Royal Scottish... No. You were the Academy previously. Uh, RSAMD, Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. That's yeah. the one. Um, as it was then called. But yes, no, they are. they have a close relationship with Andrew Panton, who... Um, is our director in residence and basically runs the whole course of Masters. And so he has directed this piece. And so it has this feeling of a devised piece, which is that from the start, we workshopped ideas and we got off the ground. We had the songs came in, mm. um, little bits at a time, actually, and a kind of loose idea of what the plot could be. And then we built it into something much more throughout, as, as devising always is. But then obviously the script came through and it was all based on these workshopped moments and these little, these little tableaus that we put forward as character <laughs> models. So I think what's really interesting about it is that it explores the kind of underexplored um, seedy belly of the uh, of the industry in pop, when usually sort of you talk about the pop artist and what they get up to. It's all about what goes on behind the scenes of the songwriters, the top line writer, and um, we actually didn't know much at the time about what exactly it was that goes on behind the scenes. So we got in touch with a couple of people. Firstly, um, David Snedden who famously won Fame Academy back in 2002, I believe. Oh, right. And he decided, um, after a brief time in the pop career, that he wanted to transition to songwriting and that actually just the pop artistry wasn't for him, but he enjoyed writing the songs. And now he writes for people like Newton Faulkner. Um, the Write, on, Write It On Your Skin album has a couple of songs by him. Oh, right. So he's, he's making a success in the business. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And he's, he's worked with quite a few people. And so... We took um, the model of an idea uh, from uh, his life experience, which was that he did a workshop in London. I believe it was last year or the year before. And he basically sort of said, OK, this is how you can write a song, but you can also sort of build it. There are, there are devices that you can use. You can have a hook here and you can basically make a song that way. And everyone just went mad. <laughs> and they said, What? This isn't, this isn't artistry. You're selling your soul. And he said, I'm not selling my soul. I'm selling my songs. Yeah. <laughs> it's the business yeah. in show business, isn't it? There's a song in the musical called In Curtains by... Um, oh, yes, Candor. by Kanda and Yeah, which is, you know, it's a business. 
Uh, yeah. And we have to remember it is people who've got to make a livelihood somehow. Well, yeah. exactly. But I understand there is, a, there is a dynamic tension and indeed a real social tension between the concept of the integrity of the artist and the creator, yeah. uh, whether they be the singer or, 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 or a songwriter mm-hmm. or both, uh, against the fact that you have actually got to earn a pound. Exactly. And so the basic plot of the show uh, followed this idea. It starts with a workshop. It starts with what this response was to um, what these people were seeing and that they were so shocked that, um, you know, our main character, V. Toria, um, yeah. <laughs> who is a pop star sort she, of modelled on... Egotistical pop star of the worst kind. Yes, quite. The sort that would have a rider, that sort of style of pop artist, uh, where they people are shocked that she hasn't written this song herself. And they go, well, well, where's where's the music come from then? And then it's like, oh, I wrote it. And this yeah. songwriter appears and sort of explains about it. And they, they just think they've been completely lied to. Yeah. When in reality, that is kind of the pop industry. And it's all very, yeah, we oh, need something now. Yeah. Um, and so the whole show just explores that idea. And you've got a workshop of amateur songwriters who basically try their hand at helping out with this business. People with talent that haven't yet quite worked out how to channel it, perhaps, or exactly. work out how best to work with each other. Yeah. What I like about this show, um, and there's a lot to like in this show, I think, is the mm. fact that um, I'm going to compare it with another show that's on up here in the Edinburgh Festival this mm. year, which is called Title of Sh- Title of Show. Uh, Title yeah. of Show, which, of course, is the meta theatre, meta musical about the writing of a show. This is almost yeah. title of uh, title of a song. Yeah. In a sense, there are several examples where a song metamorphoses in front of you. That, in fact, my favourite song in it, I think, is the one where one of the amateurs mm-hmm. just um, comes up with an idea, and it's a bit slow. Mm-hmm. So. Um, she's asked to speed it up mm-hmm. and then uh, it's giving a little bit of piano chord accompaniment mm-hmm. and then someone else says well why don't you do it like this and there's another hook and mm-hmm. a bit of guitar is added yeah. and you see it change tempo and you see it change um, arrangement yeah. and you see it, hear it change in the way it's sung and then suddenly it goes from being a little bit plonky shall we say mm-hmm. to actually an amazingly catchy number yeah. and just to me as an individual and bearing in mind I'm interested in musical theatre and the art of creation mm-hmm. and that was fascinating to watch how adaptation and development can take actually something which is a bit, as I say, you might throw away if you didn't know that you could do something with it mm-hmm. into something that's rather good. Yeah. And then later on, there's another thing as well where someone's asked just to improvise something. So he comes up with row, row, row your boat. Yeah. And then, um, which is a well-known folk nursery yeah. rhyme almost. Um, and then that's developed into, a, once again, a tr- truly catchy number. Mm. So there are an awful lot of um, very interesting journeys within the piece. It's, a, it's not a series of sketches per se, but there are sketches within it which have been mapped together quite I nicely. Think I like that. Yeah, I think there's an interesting idea of that creation can come from anywhere. And it's this, this notion of don't dismiss an idea before you've fully explored it and seen what it can become and what you were saying yeah. about row, row, row your boat. I think... In terms of the performance of it, it's come out of the brilliant songs, actually, by John and Jerry Kilty, um, who've given us various different versions of the same song along the way. And they sort of said, oh, well, you could try this. And maybe they came in and worked yeah. with us. And they said, oh, what if you just take the guitar out and mix it up? And then um, later on than that... Which uh, informs the performance, of well, course, exactly. doesn't it? Yeah. And then later on than that, our musical director for the project, uh, Simon Goldring, who is also studying on the Masters yeah. with us. Um, He's the handsome man on the keyboard, isn't uh, he? Exactly. Yeah. And he is called Simon in the show. As you're called Kieran. Yes. <laughs> yes. In the same way. Yes. Device piece, yes. we all have our yeah. own names. It makes it easy. <laughs> it's kind of a projection of what your personality could be in another life. We were talking about uh, Simon Goldring's input into this project, and... Basically what it was, was um, we all came up with various models of what the song could be and we sort of listened to them and tried to get them into our skin. Then we improvised a few melodies and he basically took that, plus what the Keelties had brought us in demo form, and turned it into a score, um, which kind of takes a lot of uh, musical interpretation, to be honest, to sit with Sibelius and work out exactly how the harmonies are going to work together so it's not overloaded, so it's that a it big still ask, feels actually. organic. Yeah, it's yeah. It was a hard undertaking for him, and I think he's done a really good job with it. So it feels like it's being written on the fly, but on the other hand, yeah. it's, it's quite rehearsed by now. But also, you know, there's that element of improvisation which has helped us throughout. Well, that's right, because, I mean, the piece is about, isn't it, um, discovering ways of channelling raw talent 
in a way that improves everyone, yeah. the outcome and the individuals themselves. Mm. You have an interesting role. You're part of the <laughs> uh, the trio of um, there's a, a sort of principal songwriter who does most of the training, and yeah. she has a, a, two other people with her. You're yeah. one of those, um, and you join in. Uh, you know, physically, you know, you show your actor muso chops here. As oh well, yeah, because <laughs> you're doing some good um, percussive stuff as well, well aren't you? you? Yes. Yeah, I am. Um, and very little... stylish, stylishly as well. It's not just uh, banging away. It's um, you know you you do it in a way that once again your physical uh, your your physicality is very much to the fore in your performances. Thank you. In very a good much. way. Appreciate so, yeah. that. I, I yeah, I have a bit of a whack at the cajon. I wouldn't say I'm a first study drummer. Which is for a lot of us, we hadn't seen this until a few years ago. This is a kind of drumming a drum, isn't it? It's a wooden yeah. box drum. Yeah. Which a lot of people sit on when they're playing other instruments. Yeah, it's it's a um, classic bus- busking tool really, because yeah. you can basically take an acoustic resonating box out onto the street and create loads of sound with it. And it's it's you know, it gives you a really nice um, oaky sort of folk sound. It's the sort of thing you might hear in Once or yeah. something like that. It's it's really, really good for especially smaller black box sort of platform shows because you can put them together and make them sound really percussive and inviting and energetic without too much um It adds richness mess. to sound as well. Yes. yes. And that, that's very good uh, in this because what I, one of the things I enjoy is the fact that your two shows are in different venues. With um, 9 to 5, you're on this fantastic stage in the uh, assembly hall, the big one on the mound, mm. you know. But it's a very broad stage. You know, it's ideal. It's, it looks like a West End stage in yeah. that sense. Whereas uh, Assembly Checkpoint, which is where you are for confessions, mm-hmm. is a different kind of room. And you've sort of, in, in, in my head, you've sort of taken the corner of it. It seems to mm. be a circle round a corner of a room. So we're arrayed round it as the audience. Well, I think they're both thrust spaces, which really opens you up to the audience. And you can just play so many different angles. And especially for a platform show like Confessions, it just really brings it to life. And you can create lots of different images um, with that without actually having to have strict choreography per se. It's quite, as a show, it's quite fluid and unblocked because we felt that it needed to have that organic nature so that every day it's slightly different. And um, yeah, it really does have that intrigue about it, I think. So, bearing in mind these are your sort of, when I say the word, passing out shows. Yes. <laughs> what, well, what next for you, Kieran? Oh, well, so we have our showcases. Um, the first is on the 8th of September at the Royal Conservatoire's own New Athenium Theatre in Glasgow, and that will be at 2.30 and 7.30 in the evening. And we also have one in the Soho Theatre in London's West End on 1pm on the 13th of September. And basically, my plan is just to keep working in one form <laughs> or luck. another. Yes. Like, I love the industry. I really like working long intensive hours because I have a lot of energy to expend and it just seems to be the perfect sort of fit for me um I never get bored there's always something to do and I think it's just a really living art form it's constantly evolving Mm. and it's really just fun to look at lots of different elements of it because obviously within my training here we've looked at Shakespeare we've looked at um more naturalistic acting and we've gone and taken our own uh duologues to work on for the showcase and for other projects as well and so you end up with lots of different potential avenues and so really i'd just love to do some work another thing i'd like to do actually is either audiobooks or oh, yes. or advertising as sort of your i don't know well radio but radio which is these are radio radio skills course, like, yes voice voice skills yes voiceovers uh, uh, forgive me yes uh, that seems a very sensible and not good idea well I'm a, i speak I'm... i speak as someone <laughs> in the field <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of accents and impressions uh, and so I really like using my voice in all aspects, really. Um, yeah, I find it very rewarding. And do you have a website, Kieran? Uh, or I how don't... can people contact you online? Facebook, Twitter? Uh, yes, I can be contacted on Facebook. Or um, so my name to be spelt on Facebook yeah. is Kieran John Walsh. C I A R A N J O H N W A L S H E. Um, I also have a SoundCloud link, which is www.soundcloud.com slash Kieran Walsh. So they can hear your composing skills uh, as well. Yes, so they can hear some of my demo tracks. I'm going to be putting up some musical theatre tracks as well soon, which I'll have recorded in the RCS studio. Um, you can also get me on my Twitter, which I can't remember the feed for mm-hmm. at the moment because I'm quite new to Twitter. Um, but it, again, it should be pretty uh, self-explanatory. And find yeah. you under the search there. That's no trouble. Well, yes, yes. absolutely. Well, I also have a spotlight pin five four nine seven nine zero five six 
8246. And those people who are in the know, it's obviously an interactive CV. So basically, I would just love to work. And, you know, it's it's I'm still young. I've got <laughs> lots I should, of time. I should say so. To uh, sort it all out. Well, Kieran, thank you so much for talking to me about the two shows you've been in and also perhaps about the show that we might get to see in the future. Well, thank uh, you All of much. which sounds really interesting. And I look forward to talking to you again in the future um, or being able to say, well, I knew him before he was famous, you know. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Thos. You flatter me. <laughs> Musical talk. And that was Kieran Walsh, and I'm extremely grateful to him for finding time to talk to me. He was very busy up in Edinburgh. He was appearing in two shows. 9 to 5 was directed by Ken Alexander, with set design by Richard Evans, and musical direction by Chris Duffy, Marcus Adams, and Ian Duguid. I gave it four stars and called it a great production of an enjoyable show. And I must say, Kieran certainly seemed to be relishing playing an absolutely odious character. And as for Confessions of a Justified Songwriter, I really enjoyed it. Although pop music isn't my bag at all, it was very interesting to see it used in a musical about the creation of pop songs. So I gave that show four stars as well and called it an enjoyable devised piece with a strong score by the Keelty Brothers. And as for Kieran himself, he's now living primarily in Cheltenham, but he's planning to move to London in the next year. So keep an eye out for him or look for him online. Well, that wraps up this episode of Musical Talk. I do hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's also illustrated the variety of musicals that you could have seen at Edinburgh this year. And as for Lawrence Owen and his Cine Musicals High, he is performing that at various places across the country, as he did with last year's fantastic show, Cine Musicals. So do go to his website and see if you can find out where he's performing. I can guarantee you a fabulous evening of entertainment. And my thanks go to Lawrence for allowing me to play three of his songs in this show. What do you mean three? We've only had two. Well, if you were listening more carefully, you would have heard me say earlier that we were going to finish with one more song from Cine Musicals High. And we're going to do that now. So for the time being, it's time for me to say goodbye. And this is the time. Goodbye. There, I was exactly on time. And we finish today with a wonderful song from a wonderful show. see me they all think the same thing they think of zombies and the girl from the ring it's the blank eyed stare and the long black hair and the sickly undead pallor of my skin I have an iron deficiency I don't like sports so all the jocks think I'm lame I don't like math so all the feel the same All the cool girls like clothes But I don't know about those Even bad girls look at me like I'm insane Everybody seems to think I'm just some nightmarish freak Cause to you I look so alien and strange But if you get to know me You'll see I'm super of you two and vanilla ice cream I like collecting vintage stamps and miniature trains But when you look like Stanley Kubrick's feverish cheese dream You find that people see things their own way Everybody thinks I'm Satan cause my teeth are all black But I just like Yes, I know my head hangs
going sideways like my neck's been snapped and realigned But it's just cause I slept awkwardly last night And yes, I do live in a well, but it's an eco-friendly domicile My dad got the idea from Grand Design If I speak up, I'm lame. If I don't speak, I'm strange. So it's easier not to say a single thing. But if you get to know me, you'll see I'm only mortal. Get to know me, you'll see that I'm just normal. And those cruel names are just the same. As if I looked like you Until you understand There's nothing I can do This episode of Musical Talk Edited and presented by Thos Ribbits Copyright Musical Talk 2016, except for the songs where the copyright remains with Lawrence Owen. And my thanks go to him for allowing me to play them in this programme. To find out more about the world of Musical Talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our brand new website, musicaltalkpodcast.weebly.com or subscribe to us on iTunes and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at Musical Talk Thos. I'll, um, I'll lean in as close. Yeah, do you mind giving me a level? Is that right? Yeah. Hello. 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 I think Is that's that fine. Sounding yeah, good. Long, as long as we speak fine. I mean, if it does fill up, it fills up. It takes as long as it takes. So yeah. If you're happy, and if you don't like anything, say, and I'll take it out. Okay. If you remember. <laughs> All right. Yes. You know, if you libel friends and family, nice. It does happen. Yeah. Or backers, yeah. even worse. Yeah. If you have any? I don't have any backers. No, no one to offend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's never true. That's never no. true.